This conference will now be recorded. Hello, this is the Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee meeting at the Road Health to Order. 331, Leroy. Um, <laughs> 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 Whoa. Here. Hi, how'd you go? Here's recording. Leroy, Jessica Atkinson is excused. Dale Schmitz. I'm here. Uh, I believe Kim will be here shortly, and Sharon Powell is also excused. Um, for Stanford Pledge. For the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mm -hmm. okay. I need to a motion on the agenda, please. Well, uh, yep. I'll second to approve it. My second, we already second by Dale. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion here. Um, action on the minutes. Please note that Kelly just, Kim just walked in, not Kelly. <laughs> Jim, all right. Um, so item five is action on the minutes. Um, is there act, discuss the act on the January 8th, 2024 by school pedestrian meeting minutes. Need a motion to approve the minutes unless there's any changes that anybody has. Make that motion. Motion by Kim. Second by Leroy. Sure. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Um, comments from the public must be limited to items not on the agenda, <clears throat> must state name and address, limit to five minutes, board rules to listen and not discuss the item, personnel issues cannot be discussed nor individuals named, and board is not able to take action at this meeting. There's nobody in the room, and I don't see anybody that is remotely. Okay. We'll go on to seven reports and updates. Um, Brian, uh, Michelle, and the public safety will be first. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Not too much else to report from um, activity wise from the previous meeting. Uh, personal wise, however, we have some uh, changes there. Uh, we just got word today that uh, Lieutenant Terry Rokir will be retiring July 5th of this year. Uh, okay. After nearly uh, at that point in time, will be an over 25 year career with our department. Uh, a very proactive one at that, too. So he will be deeply missed. Mm -hmm. On the staffing side of things, we do have five public safety officer vacancies at the moment. We ran a interview process on Saturday. We had 22 confirmed interviews, 22 candidates showed up. Of the 22, we ended up with a list of 14 uh, that are eligible for hire as public safety officers. And it's a pretty broad and diverse mix um, of uh, life experience, work experience, um, age, sex, ethnicity, probably one of the most diverse candidate lists we've had in my time here. So pretty optimistic. Um, I think we're in good shape with that. As far as back telling Terry, it's going to be a tough task, but we've got some good talent on the bench, and I think we'll be in good shape there. Uh, so that's what's happening from the staffing end of things. Uh, as far as enforcement, no real changes to report. Um, we have a uh, slight decrease in overall crashes January of this year compared to uh, January of last year. Uh, no bike or pedestrian crashes in January of uh, 2024. So knock them wood off to a good start. And then uh, our grant programs for seatbelt and um, OWI are continuing uh, as usual. I just signed the grant agreement to do a speed enforcement grant on top of those two. Mm -hmm. Uh, during the summer months as well, use that runs June, July, August, or thereabouts, depending on when the funding runs out. So that's pretty much all we got from uh, public safety. Um, just looking to backfill those bodies and we'll see how the uh, rest of the year develops. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Any questions for Brian? Anybody in public safety? Where do the grants come from? Uh, they're called BOSS grants. So they come from the Bureau of Transportation Safety. Uh, I believe it's 
We get it from the state, but I believe it trickles down from the feds oh, so to the state okay. and then to the local municipalities. So here in Brown County, uh, we've got a pretty robust grant program. Uh, Green Bay PD administers the grants for the county. Um, City of Green Bay, Brown County Sheriff, Ed Wabon, DePere, Hobart Lawrence, uh, Pulaski, Wrightstown. Um, I, mentioned, yeah, I think I mentioned DePere. Uh, just about every agency within the county participates in these. Uh, and there's two main grants that go for the better part of the year. Uh, there's one that's focused on seatbelt enforcement. Um, then there's one that's focused on drunk driving enforcement. The seatbelt ones are usually a mix of daytime, evening time, uh, kind of your higher traffic times. And the OWI enforcement ones are usually weekends and evening time. Uh, they do get adjusted for certain holidays. Uh, so we do have a special one for, say, St. Patrick's Day coming up. We've got one for Halloween. Um, we've also done some more uh, coordinated ones with reckless driving in the city of Green Bay and areas uh, throughout the county. Uh, but they do rotate around. So, for example, usually once a month we'll get one here uh, dedicated to Village Bash Lebanon, and then all those agencies will send their officers to Village Bash Lebanon and saturate the village. Um, and that's how we'll do the seatbelt ones too. So it kind of bounces around the county, okay. so that there's different saturation areas. So it's kind of to support bodies to have more people out there. It is. Um, I should explain that a little bit better. Uh, the bodies that are out there are on overtime and they're supplementary oh, staff. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we usually fill it every month. We put a posting up, officers can sign up on overtime. Uh, usually they're pretty popular. Usually our officers are pretty proactive on them. Uh, the drunk driving ones, um, I make sure that we at least fill the ones that are in Ash Wabanon uh, because we should be good hosts and take care of our backyard. Um, we have kind of mixed results as to whether or not people sign up for the out of jurisdiction ones. Those I usually don't force for, we've got plenty of overtime. And um, yeah, it's not our backyard. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I was at, the, I go to the Active Communities Alliance meeting, and so it's uh, made up people around the county, and we talked about accidents, and it seemed to be a consensus from everybody that speeds on, on the roadways have been gradually increasing, creeping up. Is that? real or is that were you just imagining that uh, so you're talking the observed speeds of what people are seeing yeah yeah so we are trying to focus more on speed enforcement there's a few things that we're doing to um, enhance that um, we've gotten some feedback from our office and we reached out to them as far as how things can run a little bit more effectively with that one thing they brought back to our attention was for example we have different models of radar units and different vehicles They've got to be familiar with all of them, but it's easier if we have some uniformity amongst the, the devices and the options. Um, the other thing that we've been really pushing is uh, trying to instill in our newly hired officers in that field training process. That speed enforcement is a priority here and spending some dedicated time on that. Um, we sent two of our officers to Radar LiDAR Instructor School. They're both field training officers, so that's going to help for dedicated block of instruction during the field training to really enhance their um, comfort level and then also stress organizationally that this is a priority for us. And we're also going to use those officers to help uh, polish up um, the skills of our existing staff so that they're more comfortable with it and um, you know, making sure we're doing everything we need to do with that. So yeah, we have noticed that it speeds a problem in the community. It is a contributing factor to a lot of crashes. It's also a community concern that we can take a lot of um, we get a lot of uh, neighborhood complaints on. That being said, though, I will mention that usually a lot of the neighborhood complaints will put up a speed board and it will give us a, a record of the speeds going through there. Um, and then that starts to get into kind of that gray area of what's a reasonable speed tolerance. Um, I, for example, um, you know, we don't want to be stopping people for two, three, four, or five miles an hour over that kind of erodes people's respect for the legitimacy of what we're doing. Um, but in a lot of cases, a lot of what we do see for that average speed is usually within that kind of reasonable tolerance level. Of, um, we might not necessarily stop for that speed, even though it is a technical speed of a few miles an hour over. But yeah, there are the spikes too, and you can see the spikes of, okay, somebody went through there at a, at a fast speed. 
And those are the ones that, that really stand out if you're a correct a resident or correct. Or even another motorist when somebody goes by and they're obviously going 10 or 15 miles an hour faster than you are, and you're probably going five over the speed limit. So. Yeah, but we've been trying we try to be as responsive as we can with it and have officers go out to these on spots and always try to answer community concerns and get a feel, even if they're kind of doing an informal survey just by monitoring traffic for a period of time with their in squad radar. Um, we have been fortunate, not a lot of people take vacations in January, February, so we've had some shifts lately where we've had the staff and actually dedicated an officer solely for traffic control during the day. Um, we can do that on two of our shifts, one of shift that's rather short right now, so when we do have the staffing for that, we do uh, try to focus on shaping that up. Um, and we've still been pretty proactive in the school zones, too. People have been driving fairly well on them, so not a lot of citations and stops, but at least high visibility as best we can. Thank you. You're welcome. Question, question on, the, on the, it's got nothing to do with the biking, the walking, but of the 14 candidates that you, you know, that have been selected, are yes. they, are they all, do they have to go to school after? It's actually a mix, and this is kind of the, the nice part. Um, so you do have a mix of people. Uh, we have two on the list, I'm sorry, three on the list that are currently serving law enforcement officers. We have three or four on the list that are currently serving uh, paramedics or fire medics. Um, and then we have several on the list that are in or have recently completed paramedic school or the police academy. Now, as far as which ones we pick, um, philosophically, we try to hire for character and train for skills. It usually seems to, to work out best. Um, and either way, we're going to end up training most of our candidates anyway because okay. of the diversity of the skills that we do need to train them in. Yeah. Um, a lot of times it comes down to just trying to plug and play based on, say, start dates for the academy. We have a, a full-time academy that starts in January. And then also trying to balance, if we take the lateral candidates, can we get them field trained up in time to make EMT class in the fall? <clears throat> if we take the fire medics, can we get them hired in time to make a summer academy? If not, we work them on shift as fire medics and then send them to the January 2025 academy. Um, so kind of a lot of moving parts to it. Uh, but the, the main thing is we're really looking for character and fit. Uh, and then we can we can plug in the rest of it. Education training is about an 18 month process that can come in, roughly with no formal they have to go. Let's say they just graduated from the academy. Or yeah, they, they have to go through the academy. It's an 18 month process. That doesn't include FTO, that's just through school. That's about right. Yeah, about 18 months. Yeah, that'd be about right. So if they were able to start the academy right away, and then you've got, so as an example, the academy starts, the next one starts, uh, I think June 30th and goes till November 6th. And then once they're done with the academy, they do a 13 week FTO field training period where they're focused on the law enforcement side. That's going to get them into tail end of February. And we have a guy that we sponsored in the last academy and he's just wrapping up his field training right now. Um, unfortunately, if you get done with field training in February, your semester is kind of shot for doing EMT or fire. So we have to hold on till, for the current guy that we have coming off of FDO, we have to hold off until the fall to send him through his uh, fire school. Uh, luckily, he already had EMT, so he's good there. But if you needed both of them, it wouldn't be until May of the following year that they would have EMT and fire. Um, and then paramedic is a voluntary thing if people want to do it. That's a year long class in and of itself that you have to have EMT for first. Um, and luckily we've got a fair number of paramedic candidates in our process. So that saves a year of training there, but then they also need police academy and uh, the field training period. So they're literally not on the street until they get completed with all that training? Uh, at least until they can complete their police training. Police training. Yeah, so they need to be through the police academy and they need to go through their field training and then they can function as an independent law enforcement officer. Yeah. For their EMT and fire training, if there's a little less demand with that compared to, say, paramedic or the police academy. So for that one, uh, that's why we have our night shift officers and why our newer officers start out working eight hour night shift. Mm -hmm. um, they work an eight hour, six on, three off rotation. And then that allows us the flexibility to send them through an evening uh, EMT class that meets a couple times a week during one semester. 
and then follow it up the next semester with a uh, evening you know, choir class. Just curious because you know a lot of businesses are just thinking with kids and what they went through is like with a, a master's or whatever you you're required to give so much service before they'll pay for that education or you have to pay the education back. Do we do anything like that or you just you're just training them and they can take off and leave after they're done? That happens. That that can happen. Yeah. Um, we're not paying for a college degree. Um, as far as the law enforcement academy, as long as they pass the law enforcement academy, that tuition is covered by the state. So that's about five thousand dollars right there. Um, we're on the hook regardless for their wages and their benefits. Sure. We're on the hook for you know paying for two officers on a squad car during field training, but the academy itself does get covered by the state. Um, fire. Fire training gets covered directly by the state, so we don't pay the tuition for that. We're just paying the uh, straight time salary they get for that. Mm -hmm. uh, EMT training, we do have grant funds available from the state that they provide to EMS agencies that we can then apply towards that. So we can offset usually um, costs for that. Now, paramedic training, that's a two semester, so a year long um, class. Of, it's about $8,500 to $9,000 when you factor in the books and everything else. But for us to send somebody through paramedic, they'll have to have checked the boxes of, um, you know, gotten the cross train of police, fire, and EMS, mm -hmm. um, spent some time here, and you know that they're going to be here. That's something that we'll we'll cover at that point. Totally makes sense when you're looking for character and somebody that's going to stick around with investing that kind of. Time. We've been like any corporation. Yeah, too, we've right? been pretty fortunate on the retention side of things. Um, just got back from a couple conferences this week, and we are certainly ahead of our peers on the retention side of things. That's great. Uh, we just want to make sure we maintain that. And then this past weekend, uh, we are most certainly ahead of our peers with regards to uh, recruitment and getting people in the door. So we're, we're in pretty good shape with that. So it's something for leadership, so good for you guys. I think it says a lot more for our guys. They're making a culture that when people come here, they like to, they want to be a part of it. They're not coming for me, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> come we, on. We've had several candidates do ride along, so they're getting, we try to push that to come in, see if the culture's a fit, see what the do it feels like from the, the candidates oh, end. Yeah. Yep. Uh, we get feedback from the officers that did the ride alongs, um, and then we've been reaching out to the, the candidates too on the back end to see what, what did the fit feel like. Are there any questions? Is there anything that would prevent you from working here that maybe really isn't an issue, just a misconception? Um, yeah, so I mean, that's, that's the people on shift that they've seen and met and word of mouth. We've done the recruiting and all that stuff, but really I think it comes down to um, the exposure they've had with our, our line staff. Thanks for sharing that. I appreciate it. Tim, did you have a question yeah. for Brian? Oh, I didn't get answered. thank you. No, it was a quick question. Going back to the things that tell you how fast you're going, mm -hmm. did I hear you correctly that they're also catching, it's like a traffic count and they catch all those speeds so you can, well, I should have realized it catches that, but what great information is that? Yeah, I don't know how our radar board works exactly, but a lot of those dynamic messaging boards, so those readers mm -hmm. can operate both where they're recording counts, speeds, um, and then they can do that both when they're displaying the actual speed to the operator, but also when they're dark. So when you're going past those and you look, well, that's not working or the battery's dead, they're probably still working. They're just tracking that speed and stealth mode. So oftentimes, I don't know if we do that <laughs> precisely, but oftentimes they'll place these boards out for a week or two in advance and they be, they'll be dark because they're collecting data and then identifying the uh, 85th percentile for speed. And then they'll turn them on for two weeks, collect data, and then they'll turn them off again for another two weeks and collect data. And then you can see the difference between when the board is operating and oh. when it's not. And the after effect. So uh, yeah, they're they're pretty neat. They are effective. They do reduce the overall 85th percentile, maybe a, uh, a mile to two miles per hour, three at most. I'm guessing is kind of what we typically see. I think you guys have more experience with it, but um, they are effective. They do seem to work a little bit. Uh, I'm sure with just about anything though, the more that it's utilized and kind of placed in the static positions, the more immune people become to having, uh, I know a lot of communities are putting up these signs now that give you a, a message with the speed, like you're going too fast or slow down jack or something yeah. like that. Because you can customize them. They're, yeah. they're pretty neat. Mm -hmm. so, Think of the one on that deep bridge. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Flashing all the time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, one of those 25. <laughs>
the communities that move around a lot tend to yeah. see more yeah. success yeah. because then uh, they just don't become part of the lion's club. Thank you. Anything else for Brian? Otherwise, well, that was good. We'll go on to Brian from Public Parks. All right, so Brian from Public Works. So, uh, <laughs> that's Brian. Okay, yeah. Brian Ricker, sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll go. I'll, go. I'll, I've been called Big Works. So, um, I'll just work my way uh, through my monthly update. So, Brooklyn Lombardi Access Road. Um, that project is currently out to bid. Uh, we plan to actually open up bids uh, later this week on Thursday. Um, with that, um, we will award the project to the most responsible bidder at the April 4 meeting. Um, and then following this, once we know who the contractor is going to be, we'll have a public information meeting um, just to make sure that the um, businesses in that area are aware of the project uh, schedule and then just kind of have a face and a name with who's going to be out there on the project site. Um, industrial park, trail reconditioning, I think we actually have an agenda item for that, so I won't get into the weeds of that too much. Um, Ashwaubenon Main Trail Extension, um, that's being keyed up by Parks and Rec. Um, don't have any updates on that. West Main Ave Trail and Sidewalk Extension. Um, on January 12th, uh, we met with McMahon um, about the design of the project. Uh, McMahon plans to continue pushing forward um, with designing that project, in turn, uh, including determining where the utility conflicts are and then what land acquisition is needed to allow for that uh, facility to fit. Are you, are you in charge of that project? Are you the staff liaison for that, or is Rex? Uh, I am. Okay. Yep. Um, Argonne Park Trail Extension, that's uh, Rex is uh, keying up that one. Traffic signal controller replacement. I actually, just today, um, I got the letter for professional services from Paris. Um, so I will be reviewing that uh, in order to get that project kicked off. Um, the traffic signal push button countdown timer. Uh, on January 22nd, um, I met with City of Green Bay to determine um, that they're actually going to perform that work under the intergovernmental agreement that we have with them. Um, all of the 12 inch don't walk, don't walk um, standards will be replaced with the 16 inch countdown timers um, to meet the new traffic signal standards. Um, design for Packerland and Grand Street roundabout, I don't have any updates at that time, at the time with that. Ryan, can we jump back to the traffic signal push buttons real quick? Yeah. So how many intersections are we talking about here? And these are these the ones just that are village responsibility Correct. and not county. So what are we talking for numbers to that about? Do you know? I don't it, it'd be the list that's been that was previously provided to you. It'd okay. be the ones that are on that list. I don't know exact it's only the ones that are non operational. Um so it's not gonna be a blanket go through and do the entire intersection. It's only the parts of the intersection that are not operational. And the buttons themselves will be part of it. So it'll be a countdown timer. Right. It'll be bigger than the ones that are out there right now that just have the hand or the, yep, the walk thing on it, and they'll have the countdown on it. Correct. And it'll do, will it do all four quadrants of an intersection or just if the ones are bad? Just the ones that are bad. So you might have a combination at an intersection, right. with some countdown, some just hands. Correct. Yep, yep. It's It was only in our budget to um, for, for that dollar amount to do um, the the ones that are not operational. So we're not necessarily upgrading the entire intersection, it's just fixing things as they become broken. Thank you. We saved all that money from having a plow of snow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, anyways, uh, so moving on. So general updates, uh, the Home Green Way Corridor Study, um, that was presented to our village board um, in January. Uh, they did deny to um, follow the request from the Bike and Pedestrian Committee to further investigate the changes um, made to Holmgren Way. Um, so that's the update on that project. Um, one of the things that we had talked about was the South Point Drive bike lane pavement marking. Um, they recommended to approve, uh, to approve that and authorize staff to include that in the 2025 budget um, to put a designated park, bike lane uh, and parking lane from South Point excuse me, on cell point from Cormier to 172. So that's a project that we've discussed here um, and they did authorize us to put that in the budget for consideration for 2025. I know there was some conversation on, on Holmgren. I think now would be the appropriate time to have those conversations or since it's in the staff department. 
can give you an update on that, that um, discussion at the board level. So I guess if there's any questions, I can answer those. Tracy obviously is on the board, so she can kind of walk through some of the conversation points that the trustees have, Ryan and I are both there. So yeah. questions, comments, concerns? Um, on one of the things I just wanted to bring up on it is um, I did reach out to Well 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 when I talked about it at the last active community alliance meeting. And one of the things Well would like to do is compile the information that we had got um, on road diets. So whether it's from FHWA, state information, or well, whatever, and put a packet, if you want to call it that informational packet together that's available for communities in Northeast Wisconsin. So it's just, this is something that may not happen on homegrown tomorrow. It may never happen on homegrown. It may happen next month. It may happen on other roads in the village of Echelon. It may happen in Green Bay. So they would like to get something together, and they are would like to work with Appleton and get the information from Appleton and include that in as well. Um, and just so there is information out there, so if this comes to be up in the future, it's something that we can have handy and can help a community or Ashwab and I can get some help to get the information out to members of our community, members of our staff, members of our boards, and so that there's good quality information out there for people to look at and, and get the research and data that's already been developed for it. Um, and you know, who knows what will happen you know, in the future. I've had some of the businesses up there reach out to me that would like that information just because they're in favor of it. They would like to be more informed if they think it's a good idea to go ahead with the road diet. So again, it would be something that we can at least give to me the businesses that are interested in it and provide them with the information, what they do with it, you know, it's up to them. Um, but as Joel said, you know, we talked about it quite a bit. Kyle was there and Sharon was there as well. Um, and they're just, it was a 5-1 vote. Um, I was the only one that voted to go ahead with it. Um, and it, you know, it just seemed that there was just not support for it either, for, I guess, many different reasons. But um, um, there, like, it just the support wasn't there, and they just didn't want to, to go to the board as a whole. Didn't want to go there. Um, Kyle did get a chance to speak um, and did you know make a few comments on it, but. Um, but they weren't open to further discussion once the Appleton thing is in place for a while. You know, that came up a little bit, I would say, but then, no. Then it was like, that's a totally different thing that it has no impact on us. Like, because it's a totally different area, it's a totally different thing, is what I got out of it, what they're saying, that it doesn't mean anything to them because this is something totally different up here. And, you know, and my thing on that is road diets are in many, many different areas. and they work. And whether it's a homegrown way, whether it's down in Appleton or whatever, um, you know, it's it's something that research and data has supported I guess for many, I, many years. I guess my feeling would not be so much that is if you're not open minded enough to because you guys as a board have to be open minded to many other things that are done in our cities. You yeah. learn from each other. Yeah, exactly. If you don't <laughs> learn from each other or because sometimes it's it's a you learn the hard way, right? Which get expensive. Yeah. So I'm a little surprised that it was just like, no, it's completely different, you know. And again, I wasn't at the meeting, so I'm, right. I'm yeah. just I, I'm not throwing stones here at all. Right. I'm just saying I think it'd be worthwhile to revisit it once we have information from Appleton as to what did it do for them, and then at that point maybe it is completely different. Maybe we do realize, just like they're saying. There's no comparison between our home and way and college avenue. Yep. It's possible. Yeah. Right, exactly. It's no just question. doing the research and getting the information. You never know what's showing. But it's like saying not to learn about bicycles and bicycle lanes from Madison, Wisconsin. Right. Yeah, They're exactly. farther advanced than us, but yeah. you can learn from that. In my mind, you learn from it. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's the only thing I would say. Yeah. I, I wouldn't want to give up on it. Right. And I mean, it's certainly maybe Joel can comment on this but I mean it's not like we can't come back and look at it in the future I would say if we decide we want to look into it more or get some more information or whatever the motion just precluded any stakeholders meetings moving forward so we weren't going to go out and meet with any or the staff wasn't going to go meet with any of the business owners the 
department managers, nobody about to present about it. To present yeah. it. yeah, that was yeah. what we would not take that step. Right. So. I guess it was my observation because I was there and it meant Sharon was there. And it seemed to me there were a couple of the trustees that were a little bit open to listening, but then there was others that were pretty definite. I think one of the statements, and I'm paraphrasing, was Holmgren Way was made to take traffic off of Oneida Street. We don't want to interrupt with that. And I think part of it, I feel that we had, a, we made a mistake in the way we presented it. I think we needed to, and in the future, we need to more to anticipate what the objections are going to be and just present it a way to counteract those, counteract those objections. Just the, the feeling seems to me, and I, I think I've said this before, the feeling in the village is, well, roads are designed to move cars, and that's what we have to be concerned with. And I think if we didn't present it in a matter of, of this might be a way to decrease traffic congestion, or it might improve safety for vehicles, you know, that would have been a better way to do it than, you know, we presented crash data and said we'd like to talk about it. And they just, you know, we needed to give them a reason to, to look at that. And we didn't, I don't think that we did as good a job as we could have to say, here's the reasons not from just a walking and biking standpoint, but just from traffic flow on the roadway. And, you know, the village certainly, and I understand Holmgren Way is designed to move cars, but I, I live on Corbin Road. And to, to me, Corbin Road divides the village. If we come down Corbin Road to Oneida Street and we go north, there's an awful lot of residences there. It's half, you know, one side is residence, the other side is business. When we get down to Holmgren Way, if we go that way, there's, you know, that's becoming more and more residential. And the you know, housing units, if you count the number of housing units, you look at all those apartments, you know, it's really residential down there. If you go the other way, if you go south on Oneida Street, it's, it's all traffic. It's all moving cars and access to businesses. And you get on Holmgren Way and you go south. And we were talking about the part of the roadway that is north, that's in the residential side, and not the part that's going south. And I think they just focused, you know, when they have a picture of the Holmgren Way, they picture the roadway going past the mall or something. So I think we, you know, we failed to really anticipate what they were going to, what their objections were going to be. And then we didn't present it in a way that would have counteracted those objections. I would say in all fairness to them is they also didn't have the advantage to listen to the gentleman that presented the safety yeah. and how it would work. So they're just basing it off, we're switching all the way. Yeah. I, I probably would feel the same way because I wouldn't understand, well, what, is it, what does that do, right? Yeah. Where we were, had the opportunity to have him come here right. and that's explain right. what, what it could and not to say that's what you want to do, but at least explain what it could do for you. Well, and the board well, had no center turn the, board, the staff did provide that that document to them. But you're right, having some presented versus as, yeah. maybe looking at it in your packet, maybe not, but reason through it. So you're right, it, may, it might have made a difference, but it wasn't a choice that was made. So I, you know, I take I see what you're saying, kind of. I think all those points are good ones too. So. Yeah, you know, anytime you're trying to sway somebody to your way of thinking, even if they're, whether they're opposed or whether they just don't know, you have to, you have to, you know, you have to do a sales job on them. And I, yeah. think, I think in the future we need to do a better, a better sales job, a better way of presenting this stuff. Well, you know, we did, when, we did, when we did the trail clearing, you guys, we yep. did a really good job of that and presented it, talked about it, and we had a lot of board members there and they decided they were gonna do that. So you're right, we didn't do our due diligence, I guess, with Holmgren Way, and we probably should have. So, it's a little easier to convince them though in Holmgren Way. Right? You're right. There's you're a lot right. more detail there, and, I, and that's yes. where I would have wanted a professional on board. Right. And that really understands it. I wouldn't even want to try to explain it. Yeah, I know. Because I remember sure. the questions we had for you. Yes. When you was up here. Yeah. 
It's not simple to understand. I, no. I get it. Why Why would that be better than what we have now? Sure. Yeah. You know, and, and I don't know how the, the agenda for the village, village board is established. I'm sure some of it depends on what else is coming up, how much time they had. But I don't think there was much of a time for us to give a presentation. I, I think they had it just a lot of time. You know, they got the notes, they read through them, and they had decided, or at least some of the members had decided, and it would have been our job to say, you know, we just want to do a study. We want to talk further. We want to talk to the people on the street, the business owners, and we didn't have a chance to do that. I think going forward, we have to be cognizant of that, and that's what we have to do if, if we have an issue that we want to describe, we want to talk about. The other thing we talked about was we talked about the bike lanes on, on South Point Road, and there were some of them that were skeptical. Why, why do you need that? Where you just connected the city of Green Bay? But there were a couple of the members that went out and they took the time and they went out and looked at it, and they were kind of in favor of it. And you know, yeah. and, so, yeah. and then you know, the discussion amongst the board was a little more favorable when they had a couple of people who knew what the, the issue was, and you know, then the board agreed to it. So I would be interested in letting some time pass and when there's data available for Appleton, at, as you said, yeah. bringing, bringing that for our review and discussion and then at that point determining what our next steps are. Yeah. 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 And I know Natalie, the director of Wella, was going to meet, be meeting with a representative from the Wisconsin planning, regional planning district or something like that. I can't, I wrote down on my scratch right now. Um, next week. So she's going to talk a little bit about road dives with that person and see if there's anything the state has or any information they have that maybe could be compiled in that report too. So I agree, you know, see what yeah, Appleton, I'm sure Danny from Appleton would be happy to give us the results when, when they get that done and then see what else is out there. There's a lot of ARPA information that wasn't shared with the board either. They have a lot of good information on road diets and why it's really important for senior citizens. And you know, less um, less traffic to cross cross is better for seniors and for young kids and anybody really. I mean, a four lane road crossing is a lot safer, or a lot more risky for people than a two lane road. So, and it may be safer for cars too. Yeah. Yep. You know, if you have the turn lanes a little bit more organized and more regulated, then you know, I think I'm sure the traffic or police department sees a public safety sees a lot of a lot of accidents involving cars turning. Yeah, and I'm not gonna sit here and say we're right and somebody's wrong because we don't know that. Right. We don't know that. We're just trying to maybe maybe we can make it better, maybe maybe it would make it worse yeah. and then yeah, we told and, you so. But. And I tried to, you know, I got Mary's eye a little bit, and she let me talk, let me speak, and that was kind of my point. I said, this may work, it may not, but we want, you know, all we're asking is that we discuss it and investigate a little further, and they just shut me down. Okay. Well, Tracy Thank mentioned mentioned <laughs> Natalie at from Wello. And I was at the, the last Active Communities Alliance meeting, and we discussed that because this was on their agenda, and I mentioned the, you know, the results of the board meeting. So Natalie said, well, I can put some information together, maybe share that with you. So that's why she, I think she and Tracy yeah. are talking. Yeah. So second whatever can we just wait. So we'll wait a bit. And yeah. maybe you don't even need a motion. I know. No, it's no, it's part of the So no, we made a contact with the that. city of Appleton. Six month report around that. We've gotten some anecdotal information from them. Um, I think in this particular case, from the board's perspective, we have a lot of conversation with staff, with individual trustees. The queue would be hard for us. I'm not saying that the board is closed minded, but they have they had their ideas set before this evil was put on the agenda. Sure. And this was originally conceived to have. Brown County do the review of that project. There were already concerns from individual trustees so, at that point. I think I mentioned at the at the last bike and pet meeting that 
you have a set of perceptions, whether they are real or just perceived, that will be extremely difficult to overcome. I, you could have the world's greatest salesperson there, and I don't know that you would have changed anyone's point of view mm -hmm. uh, at this point. So it's personal truth that sometimes that's you're never what it is. And, yeah. and, and that's unfortunate, you know. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah, and so as staff, we gave them, it's a policy decision, and we gave them two choices um, to make, is recognizing that it's going to be very difficult to change their policy viewpoint on the matter, no matter if we provide them. We did provide them with Federal Highway Administration information, debugged and wrote this, gave them a full report. They had detailed information. They had Cole's report. We would have been welcome to, you know, certainly present that information if they desired, but we knew or I should say I knew before that, that it would be a very difficult sale um, to change their point of view on this issue. They they made comments that were very truthful from that respect that Holmgren was designed to divert traffic, vehicle traffic from Oneida, and they are committed to, to that. And I don't know that changing the configuration of the road is going to satisfy their point of view. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying that's their point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and so until we get further information and, and, and maybe they see or feel something that's different than what they have today, it's going to be, it'll be a challenge to convince them or change their point. And that's, like, and that's really I can remember it. when we didn't like roundabouts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and if you think about like the history of, and I, that brings up a good point, that the history of that trauma, if you think about certain things, roundabouts on the bark, that was the original game plan. Yeah at the interchange and the consternation that that created. Oneida Street, especially the southern leg of Oneida Street by its six lanes and not four. You know, so there's there's a history here in this community of this perception that we are here to move traffic quickly and the only way to do that are through these traditional means of signalized intersections, more lanes of travel, means more efficiency. It, it, you well, just had all those old people will be gone. <laughs> yeah. And then things might change. change. Yeah. When you get the young people in, you're yeah. yeah. You have a uh, light bicycles. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it's a tough, it would be a tough position to try to convince them otherwise. I don't know that no matter how much information you would have presented to them, that they would have changed their mind on this yeah. issue, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Cold and Way looks like I alluded to. It's much different looking out than when it was built. There's massive amounts of residential up here. It's very dense residential, and you need to revisit, just like we revisit our, our um, comprehensive plans every what five years because things change, and you want to stay on top of it. You want to make sure that you're serving that area. And they yeah. weren't ready, and that wasn't something in their mind at this time. It's like we move them through, but at some point, you're gonna have to look at it again and say, okay, where are we at on this, and do we really? Want to move people in other modes? Because these people in the apartments, kind of, oh. some got to have bicycles. Oh, I'm sure they do. Look at the territory they're in, rather than yeah. hopping in a car, right. and getting and your bike and go. Yeah. So some restaurant or right. walk or yeah. walk, whatever. It's, it's more conversations great. you have with stakeholders if you're talking to right. business owners and other residents on the street if they communicate with their trustees and right. they, you know give them their feeling. Yeah, maybe yeah, they're they're just sweat, maybe yeah. sweat. Yep, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, the more they hear it from not only this committee but other constituents, the, the likely that their perceptions will change. Yeah. Um, um, Tracy, Tracy. Uh, I misspoke when I was talking about crash data. Um, and my columns backwards. Uh, we mm -hmm. actually had an increase in crashes in uh, January of 24 compared to January of 23. Uh, still no pedestrian or bicycle ones in January of 24. We did have some in January of 23. That looks like a lot of that uh, uh, uptick in January of 24 compared to the previous year is uh, due to winter road conditions uh, as a crash flag. And those are kind of clustered middle of the month. So we did take a hit on that. But yeah, I just want to make sure I accurately put that out there. Thank big you, snowstorm when they couldn't get the ice off the roads. Yeah, or the lights, you couldn't see the lights. Mm -hmm. Snow well, was yeah, in there because the LEDs don't want to watch up. Yeah, that was bad. I was out and I saw two crashes then in that morning. People going through the lights. So yeah, that was bad. And a lot of those were intersection related to, so yeah. those types of crashes. Yeah. Um, Brian, is there anything else that you wanted to share? Nothing that I have. Okay. One thing I want to share under um, Brian's. Um, and Brian probably has realized this too, but 
Paul Fontecchio, who is the Brown County Highway Commissioner, has resigned his position. And he, they have um, put Cole Rungi, who's a gentleman that mm. did that yes. like, compassion yeah. plan for us, in the position as interim basis um, mm. until they get a new highway commissioner. Um, one of the things, again, that came up with the Active Communities Alliance is um, they would like to put a letter together to Troy Streckenbach um, encouraging him to look for a highway commissioner that thinks about multimodal. So thinks about moving people through our communities, through Brown County by foot and bike safely. And um, so Natalie's going to be working on that. Um, we did the same thing when Dave Hansen was a traffic engineer in Green Bay. When he left, I still don't think they filled the position. They have not. Um, as a, as yeah, much. they um, were. They talked to the mayor in Green Bay and suggested again that he look for an engineer that has some multimodal um, background and thinks about um, traffic movement in that manner. Um, what Natalie's been doing is putting a letter together that she's going to try to get out to the different communities um, and the different stakeholders in the area, whether it's a you know, bicycle pedestrian um, nonprofit or whatever the case may be, and see about getting people to sign on to that letter to send it on to Troy. Um, the other thing that she's looking at is maybe setting a meeting with Troy and seeing if some of you, the a public works director from the community, maybe an administrator or mayor or something from the community would sit down with Troy as well and say these things are important to us. These are things that we've, you know, struggled with in the past, so these are things that are good and see if um, the public works directors in the area and the administrators in the area can get a little more um, involvement in that whole process because it's a very important position. It's a key position and it you know, roads are built and they're with us for 25, 30, 40 years and they're not going to change. And when something happens and it's not done properly or it's not looked at, we're stuck with it for the next, you know, 25, 35 years. Yeah. So, um, so I'll kind of keep the committee about in the loop with that and maybe it's something that even as a committee we would like to sign on to. Uh, letter. And again, I don't know if that's appropriate, Joel, or if it would be more a village board if they would do it or staff. Um, but I'll just keep you guys on the loop on that and where they are with that. And Kyle, you were at the meeting. I don't know if there's anything that add on that particular item or? Yeah, they didn't discuss that a letter all that much at the meeting. Okay. So maybe they would talk to much themselves. Okay. But yeah. And I know one of the things they're going to talk to Troy about too is the projects that are ongoing right now um, and put some support into them, either looking back again, stepping back and saying, okay. Are these really multimodal or not? And seeing if they can start um, looking at some of these bigger projects, like Webster Avenue is a key one that Emily is really trying to get some more input and, and narrow that down and have better accommodations on that road. So, um, so just um, that's where it's at. Um, and hopefully they'll get somebody new in there. Or I don't know how long Cole will be serving in that role. He's got a lot of those played already, I'm I sure. I don't have, we didn't talk to Cole directly, but I can only imagine. I know, yeah. I not see him. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't. Either. Someone asked me that if you would take it over, I'm like, I. That was my comment too. But. You know, they did talk. The, the meeting they did discuss Webster, and I just my thought was, you know, depending on what they do in Webster, could have an effect as to the likelihood that we could get changes on Homeward Way because if they, if they yeah. change Webster to make it a little bit different than four lanes as fast as you can drive. You know, maybe that will be an example that will be a little more palatable to the board where we can say, well, it's just on the other side, it's in our community. Yeah. Rather than in that. But, but I, I think, I think as some of you alluded to, we just keep talking to people, just keep trying. And, you know, it takes 30 years, the roads are there for 30 years. Well, you know, we need to start with small steps and right. just get people thinking. Yeah. Hey, Brian, can I quick go back because I missed the last meeting? That design for Packer Land and Grand Street roundabout. So there's no date by the county as to when they're thinking of maybe doing something? Okay. I, That's what I heard you say. I just wanted to make sure. Right. So construction is 2026. That oh, it is? All? Yeah. Um, I haven't heard anything about the design schedule. I know um, they recently just went through to figure out who they're going to use for design um, for the project. I don't know if they've actually pinned down and executed a contract for that for that project. Um, initially, they were intending on designing it in-house, 
Um, but since then, they've lost a considerable amount of their engineering staff, so I think they'll have to consult that out. Because it is a, it's a busy corner if you ever use it. It's yeah. amazing, but it is. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, um, Parks and Rec, does anybody have any input from Parks and Rec? I'll just uh, touch on for Rex here really quick. So a couple of items that Brian had mentioned in his report being led by Park and Rex to the Ashwaubee River Trail. I'm currently working with Ray to do the design that did go to, to Park Board last month. The concept design had been approved, so now it's just a matter of actually doing the physical engineering for that project. When that's done, then that'll be prepared for bid for completion. So. Uh, that's that extension that basically runs through the park along the river that will eventually connect to the new waters plant and then to, um, I think it's Bukowski Park or the whole Bukowski park in the pier. Mm -hmm. So there'll be uh, communications between those jurisdictions. So I would anticipate that being worked on for this year yet. Uh, the Argonne Park Trail, that too went through Park Board last month and then also was given approval um, from Village Board to do the design, the actual engineering work for a trail and boardwalk in Argonne Park. And then the wooded area that is actually owned by the Packers and that's adjacent to um, Cabela's or Bass Pro Shops, whatever they're going to be called now. Um, so that one, we are executing a contract with the engineer to do the actual design work. Uh, from there, obviously, there's some permitting that needs to be done. There's an agreement and an easement that needs to be acquired uh, through the Packers. And some potential grant applications for the boardwalk portion that's in the, the Packers uh, wooded area. So that that's being done as we speak as well. How much of that wooded area do they own? Um, probably I'd say a good eight tenths of that wooded area. So yeah. yeah. So I'm trying to think of what that that cross street is. Yeah, that's What's up? That's kind of like the boundary of, of the wooded area um, on the map. But there's a cross street that connects to Argon. April. That, Yes, yep. Is that April? Is that April? Oh, April. right up by the woods? Yeah. yeah. Oh, April is on this side of Brookwood. Yeah. Brookwood. Yeah. Brookwood. Yeah. Brookwood. Yeah. Brookwood. Yeah. Brookwood. It's one south of that. I can't think of the Blue Ridge. Canterbury? Blue Ridge. That's right. Blue Ridge. Blue Ridge. Blue Ridge, Blue Ridge is okay. along the wooded area kind of connects up yeah. to the. Uh, okay. Jewel Horse. Sorry, Orange. it's Valley View. So Valley View connects up to Argonne. And if you draw a straight line basically on the north side of Valley View down to 41, that's the border. Where, where is, in the park is the trail going to be? I was out walking and I walked down the path on Morris and I could see there, there's the, uh, along the border of the park, where between the boundary of the park and the highway right away. There's a lot of frayed bayes, and it looked like someone had been driving over that. It was all beat down and matted down. So is that where the trail is going to go, or uh, not necessarily in the frayed bayes, but the trail in the park area on that tree line along 41, okay. and run south, kind of where the, the water facility is. Is that a old well that's down there on Argon? That's an um, emergency well. Emergency well. Yep. Um, so we'll run south to that well property and then cut back to the sidewalk trail that's right on Cargon. Okay. And it'll loop, it's kind of like forms a loop that way. And then in the wooded area to the north between the park and Cabello, there'll be a looping boardwalk in that place. So that is all wetlands. So mm -hmm. that will need to be a boardwalk yeah. um, to address the frag mighty issue. So that's part of another project that we're doing kind of simultaneous. Yeah. So we're doing some frayed mighty removal and wetland restoration area along that 41 corridor behind Bass Pro Shops. And then if you go to the north of Cabela's, there's that big giant freight mighty yeah. field. That's all part of that. So that's all that had been sprayed this past summer. So that's where you see the wheel tracks. Okay. So they brought their machinery in there. They oh, sprayed okay. the weeds. This spring, they'll either cut or burn. They'll do a controlled burn in that to uh, hopefully eliminate a lot of the freight night growth. And then our contract will be to eventually um, restore that wetland. So there'll be oh. native wetland plantings and all that stuff. Oh, it'll be nice. Yeah, it'll, it'll look really good. Okay. So that's all part of that project. Yeah. I see a lot of trees with red X's on them. That must mm -hmm. be There's a lot of dead ash and, yeah. and a little bit of elm in there. That you see blue X's? What's the blue? Sure. Blue. 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 You know, I live on that Ashbaba Bay Trail, which is, it is highly used. It's terrific. People are wondering if he is planning to put a dogway station on the Ashwaubamay side of that little bridge. Okay. I think that would be a really good spot for 
one. Yep. So the one in the Ash Valley Park side? Yes. But that that trail is heavily used. That was a great okay, mine on that. It's so busy. Yeah, it's so great. Nice. Mm -hmm. It's a really nice bridge. Nice trail. I'll ask it over there for sure. Okay. Anything else, Joe, on Park Road? And Willow, I can put kind of the things on Willow. I don't know if there's anything else on Willow, but that was all that I had. Um, so on 8A was items for discussion and possible action. Um, Industrial Park Trail reconditioning project scope. <laughs> so this one was added or requested from last meeting just to have a conversation about the project scope for the industrial park trail. Rex had put together a map of, of the, the scope of that project. So you can kind of see the overall length. The original plan that's incorporated in the 2024 budget, uh, again, is valued at about $175,000. And it was to essentially mill and pave or pulverize and pave the existing asphalt trail and then repave it. There are a few specific locations on the trail where there needs to be some base repair, meaning the, the gravel base is either non-existent or um, uh, inundated with, with water, things of that nature. So I think there were some plans to, to improve the base and then maybe add some additional drainage. And Brian can kind of touch on that a little bit. Uh, but beyond that, that, that is really kind of the overall scope of the project. It was based based on our understanding. There was a request to have a conversation about the overall scope. I think primarily related to some of the intersections of the trail within the industrial park, uh, whether that be parking restrictions leading up to the egress points onto the trail, or even the centered bollards within the trail as well, and the possible removal of those. Um, so at this point, we hadn't incorporated any bollard changes as part of the project. We were going to work around the existing bollards. Uh, the no parking thing, that could be something that's addressed operationally in all likelihood. It's just an extension of those of those no parking areas. But um, so with that, I guess I'll open it up to the committee and just repeat that. Um, I had asked this to be put on here. I mean, as Rex put in his cover letter, this trail's been up for about 25 years. So the surface is bad. It's starting to fall on the creek. So I think it's great that we're resurfacing it and it's going to be um, back where it needs to be. So. It's a great thing, but if you look at your map, you can see all the intersections that it does pass through, and it's in obviously in the industrial park. So that's one of my concerns, and I know we had talked about it as a committee a year ago of getting the parking, um, the curbs painted yellow, so people wouldn't park right up to the trail entrances. Because if you're on the trail and you come out, you guys know you, you can't see. If you can't see, the motor vehicle driver can't see you either. So keeping, again, cars just back. And I just, my request is to that we revisit that again and look at it, because I think there's some spaces where we need to go back a little bit further, particularly near the gentleman that um, has a record, a record company, where he pulls cars at the Street, I believe, yeah. I'm right. Um, they used to park, they actually parked walking the whole um, So we moved them back, but there's, there is a um, hydrant there, and then they just park way too close, even you can't you can't see it through. So I think just revisiting that, looking at that when we do the trail, because obviously if we're refurbishing it, it hopefully will be busier. It's busy now, but I think we'll pick up more people on it, and we want to make sure it's safe. The other part of it is this built 25 years ago, and the manual there's a manual of uniform traffic control devices that's out there that we have to follow when we're building trails, when we're building roads, um, and Brian, please correct me on any of this if I'm saying this wrong. Um, it does address everything from motor vehicle signage to bicycle and pedestrian signage and what needs to be done. So they just had version 11 came out in December of 2023, so they've revamped it a bit. So my request, I guess, is that we have our staff look at the current manual and see if the, bio, the bollards, what the current recommendations are, or standards, I should say, um, for bollards on trails is. We do have bollards now. Bollards, my understanding, have to be bright colored. They have to have retroreflective. They have to have paint around them, letting people know that they're there. We have none of that out there. Um, so there would need, you know, be some changes, I think, that would need to be on the bollards if they, if they choose to make they, them to remain there. There are also some safety issues with bollards in the trail for people that are using the trail. 
So that is my request that we're going out there and doing it, and I think it's great, and I'm really excited that we're going to redo the trail and repave it. But I also would request that um, staff looks at it and make sure that that trail meets MUTCD and the current recommendations and standards that are out there, and we move towards doing that and making sure that it's it's a safe trail and it meets current standards. Are the bollards there just to keep cars from driving down there? Or? When they for years and years ago, when and Brian again, please correct me if this is not the case, um, but. My understanding for ballots, they were put on trails originally, or recommended to be put on trails, because of the fear of cars going and driving there. Um, since that time, they do not recommend them anymore. They don't, want they don't recommend them being out there because of the safety issue for bicyclists. And that trail especially is, is narrow. And when you're coming to the um, crossroad, there's not a lot of space on either side of the bollards out there to get by on a bike, especially if you're not, if you're an experienced bicyclist, it's kind of hard to get by. Um, I know Rex had said that the people at the record company had, you know, used it at one time, but the bollard was there and they still went around it and drove on the trail to put all the cars in, in the parking lot. But, um, so that's my request. I mean, the MUTCD covers everything from, if you're driving in Utah or you're driving in Wyoming or you're driving in Wisconsin, the stop sign looks the same, right? It doesn't matter what state you're in, they all look the same. So that's the kind of thing that MUTC does. It it makes re it makes standards, requirements for communities to meet to make it safer for people to use those facilities, whether they're driving, whether they're walking, whether they're biking. So it's consistent throughout the United States. Um, and like I said, I just think with our with this trail, if we're doing it, we should look at it and make sure that we are we have the safety part of it covered out there. Give me those initials again. Um, it's MUTCD. It's okay. a Manual for Uniform Traffic Control Devices. Okay. It's a federal document. The state of Wisconsin has adapted it in Wisconsin. They might have made some changes, Brian, in it maybe? No, I don't think there is any changes. Okay. There might be some <laughs> stuff that's specific to Wisconsin, but I don't, I'm not aware of any of it. Just kind of get up to speed with what's in the new MUTCD. Yeah. Okay. I don't know that it's necessarily MUTCD that is regulating or rec rec making recommendations on ballots, but it might be ASHTO's design. Well, guide. ASHTO's part of it too. And then you have the Wisconsin Bicycle yeah. Facility Design Guideline too. So there's other documents in there, but I think MUTCD does have something in there about obstructions. Oh, here's the piece of it that I put on. I didn't have a chance. But here's, okay, this is just an example you pass around. This is how an obstruction on the dash should be, and that's again, MUTCD. That's federal and it may be the same in Wisconsin. Remember, um, I hold there's some poles to hold myself up by I'm waiting on the traffic. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> trying to find anything. So I'm not disputing that that's you know certainly the recommendation. I but just to be clear, I think it I think it's probably more Ashdome's design guys than MUTCD. I, I if it is, I I've never found it in there. I went through the yeah. This is MUTCD. This is um, the version that they just um, version eleven, I believe it is, that was just adapted in twenty twenty three. What is the title? Yeah, or what chapter? You know what chapter? Um, does it say on there, Kim? Uh, I have a page number. Oh, I have some page. And I'm not saying we have to look into this all now. I'm just asking if we could check on that. Yeah. And I think the consistency and making sure we're doing the trails. Could we just put in all the trails by Kim's house? And there's not bottles on there. No bottles are. Isn't in. there one at the top when you go there to is. the bridge? No, yeah. there's one um, up by Broadway, right where the sign is, um, yeah. right by the gas regulation station. There's a bar. Oh, yeah, that's the only one. That, and that's too short, actually. That doesn't meet standards, and it's in that retro reflective. And, yeah, so there is one there. You're right. And I don't know about all of those things, but just visually, it's almost like an invitation to the trail, because you know it's a trail, because that sign is there. So you all know a lot more about biking and what people who bike avidly do. I know about what people who go on a little afternoon bike ride for fun. <laughs> and um, so I want to I want to keep that conversation open because it never dawned on me that those were a bad thing ever. 
There's been um, down in Appleton. Um, there's one on a trail. I can't remember the name of the trail down there, but um, two bicyclists were going into it. The woman in front did go around the bollard. The woman behind her didn't see it because she was totally blocking it. She nailed it. Got injured. Um, my husband was an expert witness on the case, so he's aware of it, and he's had several cases that he's worked on in regard to bollards and people running into them. In fact, I was out on a trail one day and some lady just nailed a bollard. Just, cool. Yeah, just went down, went down hard. So they, you know, they're, but they are shaky. The sensors in her bike, like Tesla? <laughs> she does, I don't know. I think she was a more inexperienced bike. bicyclist, yeah. yeah. I don't know. But, but yeah, that's why I had asked it to be on here. Like I said, I think it's great it's being redone, but I just would love for us to look at it and see where we're at and what the current standards are. And um, if the ballots remain, then they should be in there properly. And they should be the color. There are little stop signs on those. I'm trying to think back when I ride that. There's up. stop signs on the side of the road, on the side of the trail, I should say. Small little. Yeah. You know, and here's the thing with, you know, just so this happens to do with science, but. You know, again, what they're recommending as far as sign placement, you know, how far it needs to be above the trail, how far away from the trail um, for safety reasons. Yeah. If those poles are, I have to be honest, those yellow is my, like, from a distance, I'm like, oh, intersection coming up. You know, I don't really look for a sign because I know the poles are there. Yeah. Because I do travel that one a lot, and it's yeah. pretty, it's pretty rough. It is, Right yeah. now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I would just... Overhead signs, cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That'd be perfect. I mean, the Fox River Trail is redoing, repaving their trail. And I had talked to the engineer at the meeting to see if they were recommending bottlers, and, and they are not. It's just like, no, we do not recommend those on trails anymore. They're not safe. Um, I mean, I could see that. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. So. Because if somebody really wants to get down that trail with a poi or a they all go, anyway. don't go around. They're going to get around it. Yeah. So. <laughs> so, yeah, that was my request to put in and on, and just to see where we go and have the, our professional staff look into it more and see what they come up with. And maybe it is what we want to leave out there. That's fine. But then we should make sure that they meet in there properly, that the color they should be, their rest reflect at night, they have the paint. Designating them properly, um, all of that if the ballots are, are going to remain so that it gets done properly. So we don't have issues and hopefully no one runs out. That's right. So, so we need to, or, or even at least if we want to revisit this in spring when it's warmer and take a yeah, maybe make a motion that and ask, you know, ask staff to do some checking. And, Come back with the recommendation, or you know, look at it. Um, well, I mean, if we're you're right. I mean, if we're gonna if they're redoing the path now, now would right. be the time to look at it. Right. Um, yeah, because if if the bollards are removed, if they are, then obviously the pavement pavement is slightly different because then you're only going to have to pave. Oh, you know, you're doing maybe no, more. Brian, you more probably would appreciate a little more work. So uh, of course, <laughs> well, there would be <laughs> something to do. <laughs> it, yeah, it would right. probably be easier if you want bollards from the standpoint of you're putting the asphalt down, you don't have to work around those things. Yeah, it's true. We're not bidding out no pain until probably May. May, yep. So mm -hmm. I think what I guess my recommendation would be for the committee is you can certainly make a motion to direct staff to identify a potential op opportunity to upgrade or upgrade the dollars. Know, basically, put together a, a recommendation back to the yeah. committee on the dollars themselves, stay or go. If they stay, what standard do they have to meet? And then identify the standard. We can provide detail on that. And then, with that, I would maybe recommend if we're going to do that, let's look at all of the traffic control devices that are along the trail at all the intersections. Mm -hmm. And we can identify that. They're you know, just looking at Google Earth imagery and Street View, and there's some signposts and things like that that are leaning. And, yeah. Signs aren't meeting certain retroreflective standards potentially, so we can yeah. do a full. Yeah. We can do an inventory. It doesn't have to be Brian. And we'll then eventually have an engineering tech on staff. We'll send that person. Out. That'd be <laughs> a chapter, that person. 
and they're tearing up the entire path anyways. That's the time. Mean, yeah, you one. guys are still here. We're almost hey, the only thing I will add to that is obviously the budget is the budget. This was not important. It's part of the overall support for the budget. So whatever decision is ultimately made, we're likely bid it as an alternative. So let's say the bid project comes in at 150,000, and the alternate to do any of the additional traffic control devices is coming. Well, then we we can move ahead with that additional. Right? Yep. Uh, but at some point, we'll have to decide if if that item should be incorporated into the project. If that mm -hmm. makes sense. That's how I would bid it out. That way, you're making it clear. So that would be my recommendation for the committee is that would be your motion is just have us do an inventory of what's out there, identify what the standards are that are needing to be met, come back to the committee with a recommendation in order to either meet standards or remove the items. Thank you, Dylan. Okay. Okay, cool. So who wants to make that motion? I'll make that motion. Hey, Dale, my motion. Anyone seconding? I'll second it. Thank second you, Joel. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, thank you. Um, APA consider discuss Anderson Drive bus stop near the high school. So at this point, I think we talked um, at our last meeting about extending or making changes to where that bus stop is. We do have a call into Metro Transit. We're waiting to hear back from them as to what their recommendation is on that particular stop location. Uh, we talked about probably later this year as we prepare, we, we, we agreed that we probably won't be able to make changes for this school year, just given the nature of the timing. Uh, but for next next school year, we'll have adjusted that no parking area uh, on the north, north of the driveway from the exit of the high school field house area on Anderson, right? Yes. Yeah. So on Anderson. So uh, once we hear back from transit, that's kind of where things are at. Um, see where we can locate that bus stop. Maybe that is the logical location that should stay there and we just need to make improvements to the overall vision triangle for that, that egress coming out of the high school. And you have not spoke with Woodside yet about your way to talk to um, transit first and then go to Woodside? Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. And so, so we did talk to Jessica about okay. it, but I, we kind of mentioned to, I mentioned to her that just wait till we hear from transit okay. to see what our options are. And then they're willing, they're willing to provide feedback. Okay. Things happen, so. Okay. Great. So when you're looking at vision triangles, uh, you know, looking at last time, and then Metro is looking at the location of it, and then we're going to work with Woodside, and then it will come back to us at some point. So just an informational update over yeah. that. Unless there's some other change or direction mm -hmm. that's going to be things stand. Any other questions, anybody on that? Anyone? No. Um, then nine is items for next agenda. Um, we talked about Parkview Road and putting that back on, so maybe we could do that at next month. Um, Kyle, I know you were not at the last meeting when we were talking about South Point, and you had some suggestions or ideas on bike lanes. On North Road and some other areas up there? Did yeah, you I was, was going to bring different? that up, but I was out on my bike. And to me, we have a very nice trail that runs along Packerland. And the city of Green Bay has painted bike lanes on South Point, and we're extending those bike lanes. So to get a nice network between those two systems, North Point Road is a, is a pretty good road for you know, just an easy access, an easy connection, those two. So if you're on the Packerland Trail and you want to get in the city of Green Bay, it would be logical to, to date North Road. And I, I had my bike out about a week ago, and, and I talked to Tracy before the last meeting about possibly asking for bike lanes there on North Road, but I've looked at North Road, and I don't know that it's wide enough or good enough for bike lanes. Yeah. Not wide enough. It's, it's not yeah. wide enough, but I was thinking, and maybe it would be easier just to make that a bike route. And I know the rules on bike routes and bike lanes and bike, they're, you know, they're awful, a, a lot different. But it would be easy and relatively inexpensive, I would think, just to designate as a bike route, put a few signs up, just sort of guide people and direct people there. Because when I rode down that, 
North Road, it's not a great road. Eventually, and uh, that could be 20 years from now, that's going to be redone, reconfigured, reconstructed. There's a lot of vacant land there that I don't know is in some cropland preservation district or something. Where you know, they're, but they're, I, I would think that somehow that's going to be developed. You know, and when you develop that vacant land, that farmland, you're going to have to redo the road. So if we put a, you know, designate that, that as a bike route now and get people used to riding that, you know, that would be beneficial to the cycling population now. But then it's going to be easier to make bike lanes and make bike accommodations when and if that road is done. Is that by lemurs, are you saying? Yeah, yeah. So if you go to South Point, you go to lemurs and you end up, you know, you run into the, you get to the trail and if you're taking the trail and you want to get to south point you know you get to that little park and just the trail just stops Stop. that's a yeah. at that little park and if you try to get out onto cormier road it's difficult to get on cormier road i suppose you could take that little street and take that back alley that goes through that gravel parking lot which the village has signs there telling people not to drive on but I think if if we could just make that connection from the Packland Trail to the bike lanes at South Point, that would just sort of get some connectivity. And I know I've been on the bike and ped long enough that at one time there was a consideration to make bike lanes on North Road, you know, extending further east, and it wasn't wide enough or for whatever reason that wasn't done but if we make it a bike route you know we could just send people all the way down north road all the way to connect up to corbier yep. well if you would like uh, we could put this on the next agenda because it's not on here we can't really discuss it too far now and just maybe look at the whole area yeah. and see what's there get a map look at you know what kind of facilities are there what's not what the roads look like and just really brainstorm in that area and say how can we move people through here safer and get some ideas. So if, if you're okay with that, Kyle, kind of, we could stick it on. Yeah, I would, I would love that. I the think next that would, that would um, agenda, maybe just discussion of um, the North Road or the Cormier North Road area, like accommodations or something like that, yeah. and just really look at it and see. Because um, you know, I, I know what you're saying, and I think I messed everybody up trying to explain it at our last meeting because I did a very bad job. Um, so we'll hopefully get a map and be able to look at it and really kind of digest it a little bit better. Okay, so Parkview Road, North Road, um, the Industrial Park Trail, if that could, will that be back, or do you want need more time for that? Uh, probably a little bit more time. Okay. Uh, just because I, I think what we'll do is we'll send out our new engineering tech okay. in March to so, do that. That'll be their first job. Okay, so we'll say, we'll put that <laughs> off a little bit, Industrial Park Trail. Is there anything else that we want to revisit or bring back on the agenda? Okay. For Joel. Okay. <laughs> Can you hook up to the screen pretty easy? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so in the future, I think I made this suggestion once before, I'm not sure how it went over. Because when we're talking about a particular area, like you're talking about North Road, could we put the map up on the screen so we're all on the same page? Yeah. Not because some of you guys know it, I don't know, but I've lived here a long time, but there's streets I don't know. Yeah. I don't know them well. I don't know what the intersections are. I don't, to me, that's, it's like doing a presentation to yes. the board and not having all the information. Right. Right? To me, this is the same thing. Yep. It just would be, especially if you have easy access to it. Exactly. You can just throw a map on quick and, hey, yeah. here's North Road. Here's what you were talking about, the gravel park. and Because yeah. I'm not familiar with that. Right. I agree. That it would be nice. And I know we do. Haley has helped us in the past with that. And Joel's put up. So, yeah. Um, it's something that definitely Perfect. we can do. So. I mean, isn't that often we'll probably do it. There's yeah, times it's nice to have handy. So you can see and other things. I didn't know how easy it was to connect to that. Yeah, it's really hard. Really yeah. 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 But he's so good. Yeah. 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 yeah, it takes a lot. Yeah. But we'll we'll get it done. <laughs> All right. So those two, if there's anything you? else <laughs> that comes up, um, or if anyone else has anything else, please feel free. Um, otherwise, um, item 10 is our next bike and pen meeting scheduled for March 11th, 2024. And then we just need to adjourn. Yeah, we can. I'm not kidding. <laughs> Come on, Blue, right? What do you guys say? What I do you have to motion? There you go. <laughs> <laughs>
Is there a second? <laughs> I'll second. And watch one second. Oh, somebody say aye. 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 Opposed? That wasn't recorded, was it? <laughs> yes, it was. It was. I don't know.